Good evening. It's Bible study. It's Wednesday. We're here at Full View Missionary Baptist Church. We thank you for joining us this evening. We're still talking about unity. Oh, that this world had more unity. That's what I, one of our main focuses in prayer, I think, and the Holy Spirit continues to inspire me that we need to continually try to do. We're talking about koinonia, unity. That's what we want this world to think about more. And I think each and every one of us needs to try and find more ways that we can contribute to this unity. Join me in attitude of prayer. Dear God, thank you today for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person who listens in tonight and in the future to this broadcast. And God, thank you for helping your word to reach their hearts, their spirits, their soul, and their minds. Thank you, God for helping us to understand what this message means tonight from this book of Acts. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to apply this to our everyday lives, to the way that we operate, to the way we walk, to the way we talk, Lord, to everything we do and even down to what we think. God, we ask today that your word reach inside of us and guide us, and touch us and heal us. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for all you do, even those things that we do not understand. Let us all together say, Amen. Amen. We start tonight, we're still in Pentecost period. We're, uh, I believe this coming Sunday will be the 10th Sunday after the beginning of the Pentecostal period. I hope your soul is on fire for the Lord this evening. We hope and pray that you are feeling good about life. The, the heat slowed down a little bit. We're still continuing to have some concerns about flooding in the Midwest and in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we're praying for those people. The people out west are still dealing with fires. Here in the Mid-South, it's going to be 67 degrees Sunday morning. So uh, it almost seems like fall snuggle weather in the middle of summer. But we're thankful for God and the rains he's brought, and we're thankful for even that. So in Pentecost now, we're still moving forward with all the things that we need to do. As we look at our Koinonia slide, we've talked about we're going to be studying again tonight from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 is where we'll be. We'll be talking about the early church and how the apostles and the deacons and the other peoples, people that had begun to be proselytized under them were beginning to grow this church in major and massive ways. So a lot of things tonight we're going to be looking at a diversity play that begins to come up in the church as we see new ethnic groups come in and we see people from all over not only the biblical region, but all over the known world. And we're even going to have converts tonight coming from Africa. So we're looking at this slide tonight. Isn't it time for us in this world to begin to try to have a single heart and mind and to be welcoming to folks that look different than us, that may even think and speak and sound and act differently than us, but they're still our brothers and sisters. And that's what we need to be focused on as we try to look at the scripture tonight of how we can act in concert together, how we can be mutually unruffled even when we disagree. We can disagree without becoming so disagreeable. Uh, and even as war has broken out again in other parts of the globe, we need to continue to think about how this world is really one big neighborhood and we need to get along better. As I studied this week, and the Lord had to speak to me, our slide says God gives us his ear. And I took a photo of those naked lady lilies that are in my backyard. My, my wife caught me when I was taking this picture this, this week, and she said, are you taking pictures of those ladies? And I said, yes, I am. Uh, that's those naked ladies that my mother gave me 20 years ago. They're still growing a little bit back there. I need to get, do, do a little work on them. But it says, give ear, O shepherd, uh, of Israel from the 80th Psalm. You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade the mighty cedars with its branches. It sends out branches to the sea and it, 
and the, it shoots to the river. Shoots to the river, a lot of us don't think about it, but when a tree grows, it will grow out for hundreds of feet sometimes until its root finds water. So if you, for example, a few years ago, my culvert stopped up and when I got out there to dig it up and unstop it, it was from the roots of a tree a hundred feet away. And so I had to cut all that back. As we read our scriptures, we're getting all these metaphors in the natural form here in this psalm that was by the chief musician Asaph. And it was to the tune of Lilies of the Agreement. Why can't we just agree? Okay? As we go to our next one, we're reading from the writings of the, uh, of the physician Luke. Again, he is very clear and graphic. And when we read this, this, uh, this sequel to the gospel according to Luke, we need to try and make sure we understand what this man is writing to us about. He's writing about how the Holy Spirit helped to lead the believers to spread the word of God about Jesus Christ. And he gets down to the nitty gritty. A lot of what we're seeing happens tonight is, is in Samaria and in and around the whole Judean territory. And we've got visitors from Africa and even further up north. So Luke is again uh, giving us tonight. Paul is becoming more involved in tonight's lesson and in not a good way. We saw this slide that we gave from last week. And uh, this picture I put in this time was from my African American study Bible, depicting Paul probably a whole lot more like what he looked. Remember that at one point later in the book of Acts, a Roman soldier says, Paul, I thought you were that Egyptian, okay? So Paul was an Egyptian looking person. And uh, yeah, Egypt people are more, have some melanin to them. So as we look at these biblical folks, let's begin to understand what these folks really probably look like and be truthful about that. So here's what we're teaching tonight. Temptation is ever present, especially during times of church growth from righteousness. The point we're making tonight is we can talk about Jesus wherever we go. We're going to see some people tonight that they're going to take their chariot and turn it into a synagogue. Where do we have church? Do we have church at the gas station? What about in the uh, checkout line at the grocery store? Do we have church sometimes when we're driving through the streets? I heard the other day some people, were, a friend of mine said he was on the interstate and two cars were riding around as if they were ready to start a shootout on I-40. And he slowed down to let them get on out of the way. And I was going, how in the world do you get mad enough about whatever happened on the interstate to start a gunfight? But we see it too often. So don't forget to pray, even in situations like that. That's what my mother used to say quite often when her children left home, she would say to us in parting, and she seriously meant it, don't forget to pray. And remember, if you got a gossip, it's often tempting to gossip, but if you got a gossip, gossip about Jesus, share the good news about Jesus Christ if you need something to talk about, okay? That's our thing tonight. That's our point tonight. And, and uh, as we're still continuing the transition at this church, we're looking at unity amidst transition and encouraging you to do that in your life wherever you are as you move to and fro today, tomorrow, and the next day. We're looking tonight at some intersections in this book that we're studying tonight. You know, you know how you have an intersection? One street crosses another. Uh, right here we're looking at the intersection of Dallas Nelson on the left, in the middle Jack Lewis, and on the right Gus Mustafel. As we look at their stories, how do they intersect? Well, Gus Mustafel was the son of a person who had been enslaved in Washington, D.C. He is the 2X great-grandfather of our former member, Brother Barry Mustafel. He and I talked over the weekend as I thought about him. Uh, I was watching a documentary on Derek Jeter's life, and I thought about his son playing baseball down in Georgia, hitting that ball hard. And I said, if Derek Jeter can, you know, Braxton Mustafel can too, just like Gus did. He grew that sugar cane, and he told everybody about it. And as we look at what's going on tonight and get into what happened to Stephen, Stephen was lynched. Police picked him up, then they turned him over to a mob, and they took him outside the city, and they lynched him with stones instead of ropes. 
And we need to share our stories about these things, not to dwell on them, but so that our children know what went on. Jack Lewis was the son of Julius Lewis. A lot of us forget about those fine things and clothing that used to be at those Julius Lewis department stores. And Jack Lewis's wife survived the Holocaust. I guarantee you that his family told their children and their children's children and children's children's children about the Holocaust and the importance of remembering the tenacity and the strength and intellect it took to survive that. Dallas Nelson on the left is the great, is just the grandmother, the late grandmother of a good friend of mine, Kevin McVeigh, first cousin to our deacons, Barbie and, and, uh, and, and, and our head of our usher board, Hank uh, Barbie. Uh, basically, Miss, Miss Dallas's brother, Porter, we'll look into that a, a little bit more in the next few slides. He was lynched at the corner of Germantown Road and Highway 70. There's a Walgreens there now. And as I was in that Walgreens getting a COVID shot about six months ago, I thought about Mr. Porter, who left sons and daughters and grandchildren still here today. So we need to share these stories. It's not the school district's responsibility. It's not the government's responsibility to tell our children how smart they were, how tough they are, how good and excellent they are to have been able to survive these atrocities, very much like the people that came after Stephen survived, all these atrocities that we're talking about going on tonight, even as the word about Jesus Christ spread here in the time, shortly after Jesus' death, in the months and years ahead, as the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection and him being our Messiah spread. So these intersection of these legacies, we have far more in common than we do not have in common. So let's dive into the word here and start taking a look at this ethnic movement that begins in the Christian church in the book of Acts in chapter 8. Saul approved the stoning of Stephen. Some faithful followers of the Lord buried Stephen and mourned very much for him. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, a lot of these people that were being scattered, they were the Hellenistic or Greek-speaking Jews. Perhaps they didn't persecute the apostles because they were uh, speaking Aramaic and they were from Judea, from Galilee. They didn't push them out as much as they pushed out the others. But we see that the apostles were still based out of Jerusalem and other people began to be pushed out. It says that back in the contemporary English version, at that time the church in Jerusalem suffered terribly. All the Lord's followers except the apostles were scattered everywhere in Judea and Samaria. Remember Judea is the area, is the region where Jerusalem is and Samaria is a little bit over to the east and up to the north. We'll look at a map a little bit later. Saul started making a lot of trouble for the church. He went from house to house, arresting men and women and putting them in jail. Now Saul, later called Paul, has not been converted at this point. And even though his mentor and chief teacher to how to be a Pharisee and how to be a person of God, Gamaliel had said, what? Leave these people alone. He got good godly advice, and he did not follow it. As we get good godly advice, we need to really prayerfully ask the Holy Ghost to help us to do what? Take that advice and follow it. And if somebody tells you to leave someone alone because they're doing something in the name of the Lord, if it's not of God, it's going to fail. And if it is of God, do we want to fight against God, as Gamaliel said? Paul didn't heed that advice. And he's breaking into people's homes. He's got the support of the church. And he is arresting people and marching them off to jail. So let's continue to look at this. It reminds us of some of the things we're doing now. We're in this uh, ongoing Groundhog's Day filled with hate. We're having people not liking each other and killing each other because they look like them. 
We found that the, Islam the Islamic uh, men who have been murdered in Albuquerque this week, the chief suspect who has been arrested and charged with two of those murders is Islamic. So it, if it was a hate crime, it was self-hate. And it seems that on some level, these people knew each other, and the man has murdered four of his brethren. So we're all each other's brothers and sisters, and this hate continues. And in these United States, we're not willing to say what Steve Kerr said when he saw ethnic-based hate here in Memphis, Tennessee, during the playoffs. He said, not in the slightest bit does this surprise me. This is America. This is how we operate. And I continue to pray that someday in the near future that we begin to operate very differently. And yeah, Joey Sulapec is still on air. So as we take a look here, uh, we see in the Bible context that Stephen was somebody's son. And with him being a deacon, he probably was somebody's husband. And if he was somebody's husband, he probably had children. So he was the son of someone and he had been murdered. This picture in black and white is uh, Dan Settles. He was the father of Porter Settles. We don't have a picture of Porter Settles who was lynched at the corner of Germantown uh, Parkway and Germantown Road and Highway 70. It's about five minutes from the church. And we want to forget these things in history, but we must not forget. We must never forget so that these things someday can, can begin to not happen. Uh, two years ago when I retired, I went into uh, a, a business to ship a package, and the person who was taking my information requested my driver's license. When I gave it to him, he refused to hand it back to me. He put it on the counter. And I just come and asked him to pick it up and hand it to me. Because back in the day, 40, 50 years ago, being an African-American man, being waited on by a Caucasian, they wouldn't hand you something back. So I saw this form of many hate, and I said, you do understand that this is why we're having so many problems in this world. A young woman who happened to be African-American rushed out of the back and told me I didn't need to give him a history lesson. And I told her, I said, obviously, I'm sorry, young woman, you don't know what you're talking about. This was early March. 2020, I said, this country is about to explode on race. We didn't know it yet nationally, but our Barry in the lower right there had already been murdered. And within two months, George Floyd was murdered. And I told the young woman in the ensuing debate, I said, you know what? I know how to handle this. Just give me my things and I get through with my transaction, and I just don't have to come in this business anymore. Because obviously you guys don't know how to treat a customer, and I'm simply asking you to hand me something back in my hand, and you're sitting there telling me that a person who happens to be Caucasian, who, who still is refusing to hand this to me, and you're not his boss, and you're African American, and you're telling me I shouldn't speak up about this. We should speak up. And this is what got Porter Settles murdered. He was a blacksmith, a big, strong man, I'm told. From the way he was described, he sounds a whole lot to me, you know, like Hank Barbie. He was strong, he was good at what he did, and when he got ready to put his shoulder to a load, it moved. And the community that happened to be not African American didn't want him to do blacksmith or farrier services for those people that looked like him so that they couldn't, couldn't succeed with their farming. And over that, they murdered a 33-year-old African American man. It's our job to know these things and to share them with our young people so they know why it is so important to have the privileges we have today, to live the way we have, to become educated, to become skilled, to work, and to know how strong that you have to be to survive the things that Jack Lewis's wife's family survived, that Dallas Nelson's family survived. It was her brother who was killed. So back to our scripture here. Uh, The people were scattered place to place. Therefore, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Just because you get scattered, just because these things that are terrible happen, doesn't mean you get to stop talking about the Lord. Doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. Doesn't mean that you don't believe in God. Doesn't mean that you still 
forget that our job is to spread the word of Jesus Christ. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Many people with evil spirits were healed, and the spirits went out of them with a shout. Sounds like an exorcism going on. A lot of paralyzed and lame people were also healed. So Philip has the same gifts that we saw Peter and John did where they were in the temple, and they said to the man, such as I have, giveth I thee, thee. And they, Peter grabbed him by the hand and pulled him up and said, rise up and walk. And the man did. Here is Philip, a deacon, so full, filled with the Holy Ghost, so spiritually strong that he's doing the same things that we saw the 12 do. Everyone in that city was very glad because of what was happening. Yeah, I guess so. Because of Nene's brother, your sister's boy, couldn't walk, and all of a sudden, yeah, he could go to work like everybody else could. That woman with an issue of blood, all of a sudden, she was healed and no more issue of blood. People that were blind, well, all of a sudden, they could do that. I was seeing on TV the other day a person who had been paralyzed in a car wreck. Paralyzed people were up and moving around for a change. So, yeah, this is a great, joyous time in Samaria, and this is the same city that Jesus had spoken to the woman at the well in. So as we look at this map in front of us right now, this word is beginning to get ready to get out, y'all. This church is going to explode because of all these wonderful things that people are seeing happening, and in a moment we're going to see in this, as the scripture continues that Greece and Macedonia and all over the uh, GNC and the Mediterranean area, everywhere in the known world in the Roman Empire is going to begin to hear about Christianity. When you good th do good things in the church and in the name of Jesus and God and with the help of the Holy Spirit, the word's going to spread. How do you grow a church? You act like church folks ought to act. You're concerned about people's needs. You're concerned about their healing. You're concerned about being kind. You're concerned about finding out what ails them. And as best you can with the power of the Holy Spirit, you try to heal that. That's what the apostles were focused on. That's what the deacons were focused on. That's what the people that were in the church were focused on. And as we studied last week, and no one wanted for what? Anything. Okay? So as we look at this next slide here, as I said just a moment ago, Satan meant it for our bad. Yeah, he did. But, you know, on the right there, we see that depiction of uh, our Dutch painter, Rembrandt, of uh, his depiction of the stoning of Stephen. Somewhere in that crowd, those folks' coats are laying at the feet of a man named Saul. And as we see that, yeah, we see the next slide moving from right to left, right there in Jerusalem, at that point above Judea. We see the red lines coming out of there. People began to get on the highway at the byways, and they moved out of town. It's too hot in Jerusalem. They're murdering people over there just because of what we believe, and we believe in a, in a, in a man named Jesus Christ who was the Son of God who was crucified on Friday and rose on Sunday morning and appeared to us. And it hadn't happened yet, but it continued to move to the left. We see in our third slide from the right to the left that one of these days, Paul's going to be going to begin, begin to understand this, but he doesn't yet. And we were reminded that this same city in Samaria, where Philip is and is ministering, is the same place where Jesus had visited and spoke with the woman at the well. And she said to him, what does a Jewish rabbi like you doing talking to me? Y'all know a mixed race. Y'all know that we don't worship at Jerusalem because you're not allowed in the temple if you're from Samaria. Y'all don't even come over here. But here Jesus was, had maneuvered away to be in the middle of the day at the well when it was so hot. It was hot like it was last week. It was hotter than that probably in, down, in, in, in downtown the, the Samaria, uh, Samaritan city. And the woman comes out because she's living a life she's not proud of. And she comes out at noon instead of in the morning or in the evening in the cool of the day to draw well water. I remember when I was a boy, we would go to the well with my Aunt Emma Lou, and we'd draw that water out of that well out of a cistern about 300 feet from the house. And it'd be in the morning or in the evening when we went to the well. And this woman came because she didn't want to deal with the gossip. 
And Jesus told her all about herself. And when she went to the town, she told the folks some of the same things Philip was telling them. I met a man that told me all about myself. He knew I'd had five husbands, and the one I had now, well, I got him, but he ain't my husband too, okay? So she could get him, but she couldn't keep him, and everybody knew this. And Jesus still told her, I will give you some water where you'll never thirst. And it's the same place where Philip is in there ministering to the folks tonight, and that's what we're dealing with. Satan means all these things for our bad. But as these horrific things happen, we have to remember that God will do what he did for Joseph. He will make them for our good. So as we look at this person in our next pericope of scripture, it comes in in chapter 8 that a man named Simon shows up. Not Simon Peter. This is another Simon. And he's got a different type of spirit. Let's take a look at who he is. For some time, a man named Simon had lived there and had amazed the people of Samaria. He practiced witchcraft. Let me just let the dust of that settle on it. We act as if some of these dark powers that we see, you know, magically done through special effects in the movie and the media industry aren't real. But here it is right in our Bible. He practiced witchcraft and claimed to be somebody great. Everyone, rich and poor, crowded around him. They said, this man is the power of God called the great power. I remember when I was a boy, a lot of people used to drive from my hometown in the area I call Tennessee, and Memphis is in that same area. We drove right, they drive right across the Mississippi line about 50, 60 miles down to a town. I won't call the name of it because I don't want to shame anybody, but they went down there to see a man who was a known sorcerer, and he supposedly had powers. And whether he had powers or not, I don't know, but a whole lot of paychecks were spent down there, and people went to sin. And as I studied this this week, I thought about this. In verse 11 in the King James, it says, And to him they had regard. Because of that, of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Now, this is right in our, you know, King James version of the New Testament that we're reading here from the uh, the physician Luke. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. In the contemporary English it says, even Simon believed. So the sorcerer became a Christian and was baptized. He stayed close to Philip because he marveled at all the miracles and the wonders. But was he there for the right reasons? Let's see. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that some people in Samaria had accepted God's message, and they sent Peter and John. Now, the 12 were back in Jerusalem. The Hellenists and the deacons had spread the first deacon, Stephen, he was dead. He'd been lynched. Y'all, when the law picks you up, and then they turn you over to the hooligans, and they take you outside of town, sounds like an Emmett Till trip to me, okay? Somebody claimed he did something, they told a lie about it. Somebody claimed Emmett Till whistled at a woman. Later, she recanted, no, you know that boy didn't whistle at me. What colored boy in 1956... Mississippi whistles at a white woman out loud. Even one from Chicago knows better than that, okay? All right? So they took the boy out, and we know that story. Sounds like the same thing that happened to Stephen. Sounds like the same thing that happened to Jewish people. And it's the exact same thing that happened to Porter Settles and thousands of other African Americans in this country. And it's not okay to teach that in school. So since they won't teach it in school and it's against the law, it's up to us to teach our children why it's such a privilege to go to school, why it's so important to be the best street sweeper or whatever it is you do on the nice jobs that you're privileged to have these days. Like Dr. King told us, if you are a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper. You know, Pastor Mack was giving us some of his testimony this past week, and he was saying that when he became called to preach and he went to his grandfather, the first job that his grandfather gave him was cleaning up the bathrooms at the church. And I've told you before that when I look at my Social Security statement, I got an email from Social Security this week, and I didn't have to look 
because I know the numbers that are out there. And I was like, the first number of Social Security knew I was on the radar. I was cleaning bathrooms at my high school and glad to do it. And I did a good job, too. And if you're blessed to have a job today, do the best you can. So if you look back at this good news, they dispatched their two top preachers, the two top evangelists, the two top apostles, Peter and John. They said, y'all go down and check it out. Because you know those Samaritans, they ain't pure Jews. They're mixed up. They got some Jewish people in them. They got some people that were brought in after they took us off to Babylon to the east. They got some people that were brought in after Persia took over. They came down from Assyria after Assyria took over. And they bred with us and bled with us. And they formed some kind of Judaism that we don't agree with. And they don't worship on the mountain at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. In the second temple where we've been worshiping now for hundreds of years. They're over there off somewhere to the other part of the area in Samaria, closer to the Mediterranean Sea. And you need to go over there and check that out, uh, John and Peter, and get back with us. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For whatever reason, these people had begun to believe in Jesus and had begun to be baptized, but the Holy Spirit had not yet visited them. In verse 16, it says in the contemporary English, before this, the Holy Spirit had not been given to any of them, though some of them had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Peter and John then placed their hands on everyone who had faith in the Lord, and they were given the Holy Spirit. After church Sunday, those people that wanted to, that were students and staff of schools and, and teachers at schools, we anointed them. We didn't really told to lay hands on them like we do. We're going to do when Pastor Mac is installed the third Sunday in September. But the, the apostles, Peter and John, laid hands on these people, and they received the Holy Ghost. Okay? And that's good news, y'all. This is a diversity play. This is the first time that somebody from the Jewish side is calling in and wanting someone from Samaria to be in with them, okay? This is a big deal, y'all. These folks were different. These folks don't like each other historically. You talk about Republicans and Democrats mixing like gunpowder and, 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 and fire. That's nothing compared to the way these Jewish people feel about Samaritans, okay? So this is really good news. And all of a sudden here, we're gonna have to stop bringing up that ugly thing that happens when you get a lot of church folks coming in because a whole lot of reasons the people in Jerusalem were mad at the Christians was the Christians were wanting for nothing. And why were they wanting for nothing? Because they were sharing resources and they were bringing it to the church leaders. And well, what was that doing to the collection plate over the temple? It's making it stay a lot more empty, okay? At money, you got to be careful about your love of money. You need money to do everything, but you can't worship money. It's not your God. I remember when I was a young man, the OJs put out that Ship Ahoy album, and it started out with a real strong boy. I'm certain he was white, because I, I remember I watched him on YouTube this week to make sure that he, he played like a strong white boy playing that big, strong bass lead where it went thunk, 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 and it said the love of money would do what? Cash money? Dollar bills? All kinds of things happen in the love of money. And you're going to see in a moment why I'm playing this up, because this is a big twist in the story that we have to deal with and make sure, and us personally, that we're looking at it properly, because if you get too caught up in the love of money, uh, as Peter's going to say in a moment in the scripture, your money and you will both end up in hell, okay? And we're not here trying to get anybody to go there. So this man, Simon, is coming back into the play. He's been hanging around. He's converted to the church. He's a church member, y'all. He's on the roll. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and we see now he wants to be uh, on the ministerial team. Simon noticed that the Spirit was given only when the apostles placed their hands on the people. So he brought money. Big donation, y'all. And he said to Peter and John, let me have this power too. Then anyone I place my hands on will be given the Holy Spirit. Now, he was paid to be a sorcerer, 
And that was the family business. But when Christianity came to town, the people didn't need him because even though he was doing these tricks and things, he might have been making some fire, making some rabbits come out of a hat. We don't know what he was doing. But he was doing something that really wowed the people. And all of a sudden now, the Christian leaders are doing a bigger thing. So he wants to get back in the family business in a big way. And he makes a big donation so he can get this power. He is bound by evil and his love of money and jealousy that they're not talking about him being the big great thing anymore. Now they're talking about what? They're talking about Peter and John and Philip. Peter said to him, you and your money will both end up in hell if you think you can buy God's gift. And the King James it then says, thou hast never, has neither part nor a lot in this matter, for thy heart is not in the sight of God. Wow. Your heart's not in the right place, Simon. You know, here's Simon to Simon, right? Remember Simon Peter? They both had the same given name with a different spirit. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. What is gall? That's that stuff that's in the gall bladder. And I remember when I was a boy and we would clean fish after going fishing. But my daddy had gone up on the Tennessee River up at Pickwick and brought back a boatload of fish that we would then clean and sell in my hometown. We had to be careful not to pierce the gallbladder. And so Peter is a fisherman now. He sold a whole lot of fish. He knows when you butcher a fish, you don't kill, you don't pierce that gallbladder. And he knows that if you do, it's a bitter thing to have some fish with that Bowel in it. Thank you. That bowel in it. Thank you, brother. Uh, so that gall, a bitterness, it's got this man in a bond of iniquity. We have to make sure that we're doing something for the right spirit, for the right reasons. And we got to be real careful around that dollar bill, like the old, you know, OJ said, for the price of money, all kinds of things. I won't even get into the detail because I don't want to offend anybody, but all kinds of things. Uh, happen for that dollar bill, okay? You gotta have that dollar bill now. But be careful about the love of money. Simon, not Simon Peter, but this Simon the sorcerer who's backsliding right now. He's on the church rolls. He's there on Sunday. He's helping pass out to communion on first Sunday, but he got a wrong place in his heart. We have to search ourselves. Make sure we're not bound by evil and be real careful of the things we do and why we do them. This past week as I studied this and started thinking about all these things that were going on, I remembered again, like I said earlier, my mother would say to me what Peter said to this man. He said, don't forget to pray. Simon said, and this is Simon Peter saying to the other Simon. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting it mixed up. This is Simon the sorcerer saying, Please pray to the Lord so that what you said won't happen to me. He understands. It convicted him. A lot of times when somebody comes to us and we've done something wrong, hey, we don't want to hear, hey, I, you were wrong, dude. We get so political in the church sometimes that, hey, we don't want to tell somebody, yeah, no, that, you shouldn't have done that. You know, you shouldn't have done it. And when somebody tells us something that we shouldn't have done, and then we know we shouldn't have done it, we ought to say to that person, yeah, I'm wrong, and please pray for me that I can get my heart straight. And to Simon, the sorcerer's credit, he said to Peter, please pray to the Lord so that what you said won't happen to me. Dude didn't want to go to hell. He had been a sorcerer now. He'd been working with Satan a long time. It was his business. He knew what hell was going to be like, and he didn't want to go there. After Peter and John had preached about the Lord, big time, good revival, y'all big time over in Samaria. A lot of things to report. They went back to Jerusalem, and I'm sure they reported to the other 10 of the 12. And unlike the Hebrew spies, spies where 10 did not believe and two did, only Joshua and Caleb believed. When they got back, the other apostles were probably amazed, but they were on their way. They told the good news in many villages of Samaria. So they preached on the way there. They preached when they got there. And on the way back, 
they converted more folks. So you got a lot more Christians all over Samaria to these ethnically different people than the Jewish people back in Jerusalem. Even ethnically different than the Hellenist Jews, those who were born Jews in other countries and spoke other languages, and those people who had been proselytized from other ethnicities and joined Judaism. So you're getting to see this whole diversity thing going on that we in the church need to be focused on, that when we see people that are different than us, they're still God's people. When we see people that look different than us, they're still God's people. We don't joke about it. We don't talk about it. We don't act unconcerned when their people got murdered, like the four Islamic men got murdered in Albuquerque over the last uh, month or two, and I think a couple in the last week. We need to be prayerful for them because they're sons and husbands and and, and and fathers have been laid to rest. You know, my blood ran cold when I saw that man this week say, I don't care about anything because my only brother has been killed. My God. And then to find out later, it was someone who looked like his brother, who was Islamic like his brother. And Islam is a, is a, is a religion of peace, as Christianity is supposed to be. But I'm certain that the people that killed Porter Settles at the corner of Highway 7 in Germantown Parkway were at somebody's church, and I'm certain when they did it, it might have even been in the commercial appeal like it was when they murdered the people at the four-way grill, four-way stop at Mississippi Boulevard and Walker Avenue, you know, way back in the 1910s. So we need to be concerned, I'm sorry, 1870s was when that really, when that happened, 1870s, 1880s. So these things have happened all over, and it is our job in whatever culture we're in, to share these things, not in a bitter way, not in a galling way, so that we can try to make sure that there are no more Ahmad Alberis. I told those two young people, and their boss was so afraid, you know how I get sometimes when I get in on these things? Because I was trying to get these young folks to understand, when this man can't see me as a human being, this is why I get killed in the street. Because you see me like a beagle hound, like those 4,000 hounds that were being mistreated and they're trying to give away from all over Virginia right now and all over the country. I'm a man. Like Martin Luther King's uh, marchers said when they, he was here. I'm a human being, like God said. He, when he formed Adam and Eve, he formed a part of me that's still in me. And we need to begin to look at people like that. And we need to understand that as they killed Stephen, they killed Porter Settles. And they killed the three men that owned the grocery store and objected when uh, they were being mistreated because they were succeeding at business. And as we look at all these things, like May D told me, don't forget to pray. Because what else can you do when you see these horrific things that are going on in our country and in our world and all over our communities? So as I looked at all this this week, I'm a graduate of Memphis State University. When they marketed to me that you can get a new diploma with University of Memphis on it, I was like, no, nah, I like the name Memphis State. And I get excited when teams wear the throwback uni uniforms. We're right here on this picture on our screen right now. Let's go back to the uh, Memphis State 8 slide, please, sir. Uh, in that upper right corner is retired Major, Air Force Major Luther C. McClellan. He was part of Memphis State 8, the first eight African Americans that went on campus and Got it done. Brother McClellan came in there as a sophomore after one year at a local HBCU, Lamont Owen, and he, he, he majored in math, y'all. That's a real major, okay? When I got there, I, they asked me, well, what do you want to major in, Dwight? I thought to myself, well, not math. <laughs> Brother McClellan majored in math. He got it done in three years. As we look at our young people, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of graduates that are African American have come through there since then. But these Memphis State eight. And Brother McClellan has our thoughts and prayers this week because number six out of that eight died this past week. And he had just spoken to him a little bit earlier. And so Pastor called him the other day and talked with him. And so let's keep him in prayer. And let's be thankful for the shoulders like his that we all stand on in different places where we've gone into places and succeeded where folks who look like us has not succeeded before. And like these Samaritans had not succeeded with joining part of Judaism and being involved in the community of God, all of a sudden with Christianity they diversified. And you're beginning to see this formation 
of this diversity play that Luke is writing about, him himself being Hellenistic, a Greek person, a person from outside of Judaism who's come in and is writing about all this in graphic detail so that today we can remember just like we remember that in the fall of uh, 1959 when I was just a little boy, wasn't even, I probably was standing by then, you know, next to my mama's knee and you know, I wasn't quite the knee baby because I was the baby and every chance I got I was in mama's lap. But like I say, we have a lot to be thankful for and we look up to people like uh, Brother McClellan and he's in our thoughts and prayers tonight. So as we look at this and I think about as I've had the opportunity to serve you over the last uh, about 16 months now. We've done this together close to 80 times, y'all. Uh, it's been a humbling experience of the awesome responsibility of sharing Bible study at this church. And hopefully it's helped you. It sure has helped me. And as Brother Mandrill and I were talking about it, I was thinking, he was going, well, Dwight, how do you remember these stories? I was like, I remember them because my mama made investments in me. When I was a boy, my mama bought that book in the upper left corner, Bible Stories That Live. I, I, I had it until recently, I just gave it away. I gave it away to a man with some beautiful sons, and he's a great father. And his name is Mandrew McGrawson Jr., and I know he's gonna read it to his boys. That book cost my mama $25 when she was making about two fifty dollars a day, okay? Do the math, that's, that's two weeks pay, y'all. And my mama bought that book home, and I was a little boy, I knew we were poor, because she sent me to town one day when she was pregnant with my sister Lisa. I didn't know it at the time, until a month later she had the baby, and my brother was away at school, and she just told me, Dwight, I'm, you're five years old, but here's something I want you to go to town and get. And I said, what is it, Mom? She said, we don't have anything for dinner. And I didn't know that about money and credit. When I got up there, the store who was owned by white people wouldn't give me the food. And I said, why won't you give it to me? Well, your dad owes us a lot of money. I said, you know daddy gonna pay you. And we ain't got nothing to eat at home. I'm five now. And I've walked about a mile and a half to town by myself. My mom was at home eight months pregnant with Lisa and a thunderstorm popped up. It was August, just like a thunderstorm popped up today as I got to church. And my mama had been to the cotton field earlier, like she was in the cotton field with me, pregnant with me up until eight months and picking cotton. And as I looked at my mother a few years later buying this book, I knew that these Bible stories are important. Are we reading these stories to our babies? Do our children know the good and the strength of the Lord? Do they know how good we're going to be and make it? My battery's gone low on me, uh, Brother Mandrill. I may have to switch to you doing the slides on the screen if, I, if it quits on me. We're getting close. And so bottom line here, stories are important for us to share. And I share stories because that's the way my mother shared them with me, like her mother shared them with them. I'm finally ready to write again now. And as we switch into the next part of the scripture, we're going to see that a woman, a man from Ethiopia is going to come into the scene. This is the cover art for my second novel. And as I wrote it, a lot of things were going on in my life and that is the picture of the woman that came into my mind. I based her on Queen Esther from the Bible and Queen Esther, who was the great-great-grandmother of a dear friend of mine. He's going to be preaching in Fort City, Arkansas in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to be going over to see and hear him preach. And so basically, as I look at all of this, Ethiopia's in Africa, y'all. Those folks in Africa look a whole lot like you and me. And as Christianity comes onto the scene, we look at this slide with the chariot, and we see Philip, as we're going to read in just a moment, a distinguished man who happened to be from Africa, and he's far, far from his African home. So uh, Porter Settles could have worked on a chariot like that. He could have fixed that wheel, and he sure sh could have shooed the horse. So when we look at this chariot for a synagogue, the Lord's angel said to Philip, go along the desert road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's the same Gaza where they're shooting shells back and forth, and thank God we're under another ceasefire in, Jer in Jerusalem today. So Philip left, left. An important Ethiopian official happened to be going along that road in his chariot. 
He was the chief treasurer for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. The official had gone to Jerusalem to worship and was now on his way home. Let's go back to the King James Version. In 27 it says, And he arose and went, and behold, a great man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now it's a long way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Well over a thousand miles. Ethiopia is way down in Africa, okay? These are dark-skinned people, so when he got there, he would have been ostracized because of how he looked. He would have been ostracized because of how he spoke. And it was against Judaic law that Paul adhered to, and the Pharisees adhered to, and the Sadducees adhered to, and the Sanhedrin adhered to, for a man who was a eunuch and who had been sexually altered to enter in the temple. In Deuteronomy 23 and Leviticus 21, it says that a man who has been physically, either accidentally or on purpose changed that way, cannot enter into the worship. So this man had come all this way, and we don't know exactly what his worship experience had been at Jerusalem, but high probability it was not a good one. And yet as he's returning, he's reading from the book of Isaiah. He's reading the parchment, probably from the Septuagint, the Jewish Bible that had been converted into Greek. And he's reading this Bible. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. We need to go talk to folks that look different than us when the spirit tells us. And go talk to these people about Jesus. And Philip ran thither. Philip was in good shape. Y'all. He was out in the desert now. And he breaks out running. And heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? reading the Bible. He doesn't have any commentaries. He sure hadn't been up in many synagogues reading it and getting instruction like Paul had. Okay? And let's see what he says. They're right there on the road now, headed back toward Africa. They're outside of, you look down there in that crook, where it crooks to the left on that, on that, uh, of the screen on that orange, that's where Gaza is. Same place where it is today. And they're headed back toward Egypt, and from there he's going to head southwest across Egypt into deeper Africa, and he's trying to get home. It's been a long journey up there and a long journey back, and he has probably not had a good experience because he's different. My battery's low, and it is quitting, so let's adjust here. Put on the screen for me, Brother Mandria, where we are on my next slide, and I'll take a look. And I can go from there. I'll probably get you to read for me. That is a map of the modern day. I'll go back to that slide you're on. That is a map of the modern day, what's going on in Jerusalem tonight. In Gaza, that's the map of the current territory. And that fireworks show is not a fireworks show on the next slide. It is the one of where they are shooting all over the country, all over the area. So we've got missiles being shot. Right now, they're on a ceasefire. The folks that don't agree, didn't agree then, guess what? They're having trouble disagreeing today. And it's time for us to begin to straighten some of this out. And it's not going to be straightened out without our help, without our prayers. As my mother said, we need to be praying about these things. These are important. These are thousands of year old conflicts. And they're not going to go away. Brother Mandrill, go to our next slide. The next slide, sir. Okay. What we're saying here again is, these are the same things we're dealing with. We were dealing with in 1968 in downtown Memphis. This is the same reason Rosa Parks had to sit on the bus and, and refuse to get up. These are the same reasons that Porter uh, Settles was murdered. These are the same reasons that Dr. King was murdered on that balcony and got stopped from going to dinner and continued to do the great work that he was doing. These are the same reasons that the uh, Islamic men were killed by an Islamic fellow. These are the same reasons that African-American men are shooting each other in the street over silliness. 
We've got to do a better job of teaching, of how to remember. We need to ensure that our children know that a young man named Emmett Till was killed mercilessly for no reason, and that, so why are we killing ourselves, okay? So if you go to our next slide and we work toward finishing this up, move on to the next slide, Brother Mandrill, so I can see where we are. We remember that Bill Russell, yeah, he did his job as a basketball player, but after the murder, the lynching really with a, with a rifle of uh, Medgar Evers, he went back the next year in 1964 and did a diversified basketball camp in Mississippi. Can you imagine what that was like and what type of courage that took for Bill Russell to do that? But he was that type of man. He heard Dr. King's speech in 1963, I have a dream, and we need to have a dream. And what dream are we working to fulfill? Let's move to our next slide. I apologize for our technical difficulties tonight. All we're talking about this evening is, is it's time for us to get connected in ways that we have not been connected. It's time for us to deal with each other's humanity and where we are and take us for the good and the bad that we bring, but recognize that most of us bring more good than we do bad. It's time for us as Christians to reach out for those who are hurting and you got to be hurting when you shoot someone like they're a dog in the street that you wouldn't shoot and it's a human being. We've got to do a better job of telling these stories so that like the, the family of Jack Lewis as they mourned their patriarch this week so that these things never happen again that happened to his wife's family. We need to be connected to each other on the level that God wants us to connect to. Let's roll to the next slide. One more time. Uh, this past week, the little deer is still running across my lawn, and I'm going to have to finish up here this, right now. I apologize again for my battery went out. I'll plug up next time when I come in. But we'll finish this up next week. We do want to continue to say to each of us, if you didn't hear Pastor Mac's sermon on Sunday, I've been reveling all week. I'm a water walker now. And if you have not... I uh, heard the sermon about water walking as Philip walked out, Peter walked out to Jesus. You need to focus on that. We've had good, strong leadership at this church. Pastor Pegg's led us for almost 40 years, and he had a vision. He took us a mighty long way. In the last 18 to 24 months, Pastor Williams has done a masterful job of handling all the powerful forces, sometimes dark, sometimes not so dark. And we now have a great new pastor, Pastor Mac Reynolds, He's preaching and teaching God's word. I'm looking forward to soon when he takes this forum over so I can sit down like the baby bird and get myself fed and sit back and listen to his word as the God gives him, him the teachings that he's going to take this over sometime in September. So as we move forward together, remember, don't be the stubborn person. Don't be the person who's not hearing God's word. Don't be the person that's not willing to be coming in and being unified. Remember not to be that stubborn person. Next time I get together with you will be a couple of weeks from now. But when we do, we'll pick up about Philip ministering to a man who looks very different to him. We'll pick up about this eunuch who has been physically altered, y'all. He does not have male genitalia. He is by law not allowed in the church. And we're going to talk about how he becomes a Christian anyhow and take God and Jesus' message back to Ethiopia. So as we end tonight, join me in the attitude of prayer. Remember, there's still 450 people a day dying in this country from COVID. Remember to stay safe. Remember to wear a mask. If you're not vaccinated, please prayerfully go get vaccinated. Join me in prayer. Dear God, we thank you today for all that you've allowed us to do over time in your name. Thank you, God, for continuing to anoint us like the people were anointed in this book of Acts. Thank you, God, for helping us to share Jesus in the way we act and what we say and don't say and in who we are and through sharing God's word. In the name of Jesus, we ask that you touch everybody. We look in on the household of the family of Brother Prater who was part of the Memphis State 8. We thank you for his service to humanity here and far. 
And we thank you, God, for looking in on Brother Luther McClellan and his other remaining classmate. We thank you for the legacy that he's given us and left with us. And God, we just thank you for all the blessings you give us. We thank you, Lord, for the direction you're leading us in. And we're excited, Lord. We are excited, Lord, about your word and about our ability to help. In the name of Jesus, let us all together say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Sorry about that, y'all.